to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. I'm here with Greg Glyer. He's the founder of DonorC, which has raised over $4 million for the world's poorest. From 2013 to 16, he lived in Malawi, Africa, building houses and crowdfunded Sustainable Girls High School. He's the author of the book, If the Poor Were Next Door. And obviously, if you're watching the video, you can see my DonorC t-shirts. I'm a supporter of the DonorC. And so, Greg, thanks so much for joining the show. Yeah, it's great to be here, Eric. Thanks very much for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to talk to you. And I when I first heard about your project a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, uh, it was definitely a really interesting concept. So uh, why don't you talk about what Donor C is? Maybe then we'll go back to the history, sort of how you um, how you started in relief work. Yeah, definitely. So Donor C is a platform where donors get to see where their money goes when they donate. Um, so if you make a donation of any amount on our platform, you can pick who you want to make your donation to. Let's say that you donate to a young girl in India. Um, and you make your donation to her, and then a few days later, you'll get a video update of her hearing for the first time. And we do this with all sorts of different needs. You can give to education projects, sustainable projects, entrepreneurial projects, very urgent medical-related needs, um, health-related costs, anything anything like that. Um, you can pick who you, who you want your donation to go to, and then you'll get a video update every time showing you exactly the impact that you made. Yeah, it's very different from most organizations where you, you know, not to take anything away from the organizations, but it, you know, you give to their fund to do something and then they do something with mm-hmm. the money. And then of course you have to know how much money is overhead or whatever. But uh, this is, these are very like, um, is it like Hope International does this too, where they have very small um, sort of micro loans they give people to start a businesses. It, it feels very yeah. much like that. Like they're very kind of small, usually very small projects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Kiva does that. Hope International um, does some of that stuff too. Uh, actually, the CEO of Hope, Peter Greer, is a good friend of mine. He wrote a review for my book. Um, so yeah, the, there's there's a few of these like small things uh, that like micro loan programs that do something similar. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the unique thing is nowadays with video and how inexpensive and digitally you can just transfer stuff. You have the ability to really personalize. Um, people's involvement in, in uh, mm-hmm. relief work, right? Which is the difference. So you, you're you a young guy still. So <laughs> tell your story, I guess, of how you how you got started in this, this business, so to speak. Uh, you know, I yeah. mentioned, I read that you were 2013, you're in Africa, but what led you there and what led you to launch DonorC from, from, your, from your experiences? Yeah, so um, I graduated from college in 2013 and immediately kind of went into the corporate world and during that year in the corporate world i was very successful but also just pretty uh un- i would i would say uh, dissatisfied but i would go even further say i was like kind of depressed like i was just like i don't know if this is really what i want to be doing with my life just like kind of working in this corporate world setting um and so i started looking for opportunities uh to go overseas um i just thought you know, if I, I can just like, I want to kind of almost like blow up my life, just do something so radically different. Cause I know whatever I'm doing right now is like, not going to satisfy me. So I'll, whatever kind of comes my way, I'll, I'll take. So I had the opportunity to go teach math in Malawi. So I, I taught pre, uh, pre-calculus and algebra two while I was in um, my first year in Malawi at this international school there. And um, yeah, while I was there, uh, I, was a teacher but also like on the weekends and on friday afternoons i would go out into like some of the local villages in malawi the year i moved to malawi malawi was ranked as the poorest country on the planet um and so i when i would go into these villages i would interface and talk to people who like were literally living on 30 cents a day maybe a dollar a day very very vulnerable situations completely put my life in perspective um and so uh i met this little girl named emily emily was an orphan um her her father ran away and her mother was an orphan um actually because of a medical related need um she was unable to afford twenty dollars to go to the hospital there's a local government-run hospital which is hard to get into just because it's so overrun but 
but even apart from that, there's like a bus ticket that she had to buy to get there. She couldn't afford the bus ticket. So for, for about six months, she just didn't have um, any medical treatment and subsequently died from that very tragically. And so I met this young girl, Emily, and learned her story. Uh, She was in the village, you know, that I would go hang out at on, on Friday afternoons. Um, And really, I think that was the, that was one of those like key moments in my life that kind of shifted a lot of things and put them in perspective because, you know, I kind of came from, I came from a, I I was a private school kid. I I thought that I was poor because um, I I drove a Dodge Stratus and my, my friends in uh, (laughs) high school, they drove Mercedes Benz. So I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm so poor. And then I met this girl who just, who had much more, who, who literally had like a, you know, there's people who have very difficult problems here in the U S because of sometimes mental illness or sometimes, um, because of, you know, drug addiction or things like that, homelessness, there are those kinds of issues, but, but rarely in the U S is it like a purely material issue. Um, whereas here in, in Malawi, poorest country on the planet, uh, almost everyone is suffering from like a purely material issue. And then some people really get the short end of the stick and they, they don't make it because of a $20, because they can't afford twenty dollars because they're living on a dollar a day and all that money is going to food and providing for their family. So, yeah, that was kind of the, the genesis of everything. And then what what led led you to launch Donorsee? Because uh, was it just the thought of you could crowdfund these sorts of things, or because I mean that's kind of what it's it feels like a GoFundMe and a more mm-hmm. sophisticated platform. Yeah. So while I was over there, um, I when I so I I met Emily um, and I I learned these stories and I actually started blogging about them and the blogs would uh, not get that much traction I was like why is this not resonating with people like what's going on like I want people to understand what I'm seeing um, and I think I'm a good writer but it just wasn't I mean it was resonating with people but it wasn't like spreading um, right. and it wasn't like connecting deeply but people were responding so then I started making videos um, and that worked a little bit better people were like whoa I, like I, I kind of get it now like you get like you can um, like you can see exactly like what's going on over there you can see how people live and, and so that was like the second iteration and then I started doing this series that was actually called village Fridays so um, every Friday like I said I was going into the village anyways I would just bring my camera with me I would film someone who is in need I would allow people to donate through like a PayPal link and then I would send them and then the next week I would make a video update showing them like this is what last week's need was now present, present a new need I did this over and over again then from that I um, just did larger and larger needs until you know my last several months in Malawi um, after I'd been there for three years we crowdfunded hundred thousand dollars to build a girls school um, Several thousand people got involved in in that kind of crowdfunding project, and we we created video updates of the construction al- along the way. Um, and then, basically, the school launched on September fifth, twenty sixteen. And then three weeks later, um, I had got, gotten everything ready to launch Donor C, kind of in the background. And so there was always there was already this like existing donor base from the girls' school crowdfunder that we launched into Donor C, and then people were getting video updates. And then every time they get a video update, they come back to the platform, they give some more, and it, that's kind of how it took off. Yeah, you can definitely see the genesis of it from that, from how that worked there. I mean, you you're you're sort of you had the example right, and then it, from there, that's very interesting how sort of those. Um, I don't know if it's entrepreneurial. I mean, I guess it is in some ways, right? Just that you were looking, you're tra- you're solving the problem, right? Like personalizing what you're seeing and and communicating that to people. Where, to your point, I mean, it it is impossible for us in the United States to really have a feel for what abject poverty really is. I mean, even like, for me, I lived there for three years, and it's still. And I just visited recently, uh, two months ago. I went back to visit for to kind of oversee the. Um, the STEM high school that we're, we're currently fundraising for. And um, yeah, while I was over there, I would just, I talked, I sat across the table from people and like, I still talk to these people on a regular basis on the, on through WhatsApp or, or on through email or something like, or even zoom sometimes. Um, but sitting across the table from them hearing, you know, COVID was pretty rough on people living in rural areas. Um, for, not from, not because of COVID, but mo- mostly because of um, just the way that, the economy was affected in these areas. Um, And it was, you know, you just sit across from them and you just hear how difficult their life has been. They're just telling you, and not because, not because they're trying to get my sympathy or anything. They're just, I'm just asking them questions. Like, I want to know, like, tell me more about your life. It's hard to imagine. Like, it's hard to imagine. It's the same planet. It's it's really difficult. Even for me, I was like right there two months ago. Um, So yeah, that's what we, we work hard to do. 
Yeah, well, and I think that's great. And I would say the the platform is actually a lot easier to use than it was when it was initially launched. And and mm-hmm. there are lots of the functionality is is pretty nice because now. So we have uh, as background, we have a foster son who's from Guatemala. He's an immigrant we took oh, cool. in uh, about f- now. It's like almost five years ago. He needed a kidney transplant. He got the transplant anyway. So a lot of health things. That's he's amazing. Doing great. He's doing great. Um, but you know when we we have when we support projects, it's like you'd be really neat doing stuff back in Guatemala and Central America, which you know. I mean, you can help people anywhere. It doesn't really matter right? as long as someone yeah. can help. So, uh, so it's kind of nice because we can single out you know places in Guatemala to to help out people who turns out they kind of look like him. <laughs> they, they <kinda laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so kind of cool. It's, it's kind of cool. Uh, that's another question. You know, I've had people ask me where uh, where do you find the people who are doing this? Because you know, obviously, you're not you were one guy with a camera. Well, there are people in all these different countries. How yeah. do you vet them? How do you you know how do they I guess, how do you get them incorporated into your platform? Yeah, it's a good question. So we actually used to have an open platform um, and it was, uh, you know, it was a little bit too idealistic the way that we initially launched it. We kind of thought we'll have an open platform. People will be able to leave reviews and through, through that kind of system, it'll like kind of police itself. What we found out was um, people really preferred what is called like a curated marketplace where, where there is vetting. So, you know, you can think of GoFundMe as like a YouTube, just anyone can post anything. And then DonorSea would be more like a Netflix. Like we curate our projects. We only partner with highly vetted people and organizations. Um, the way that we do it, there's a lot of third party. So we don't try and reinvent anything um, that we don't need to. So there's a lot of really great third party uh, vetting platforms uh, like Charity Navigator and and so forth. Um, And so we use data from them to kind of vet the organizations that are coming onto our platform. We also do reference checks. And then on top of that, um, one of the cool things about uh, all of our partners on DonorSea is that when you make donations, you can actually leave five-star reviews for them. So you can see the reviews that other people have left for them. And a lot of times the people who are leaving reviews are people who like know the organization personally. You can see their donation history with that organization. Um, and so you have like quite a bit of social proof when you're um, when you're donating. But yeah, everyone everyone is vetting. Everyone is vetted. We have people who can who do use our platform to fundraise who are not part who are not like presented you know, to our donors and they're kind of like in the vetting process. Um, but yeah, if you come to donorsea.com, you start looking for projects, all of those are highly vetted um, by, our, by our our vetting team. How do they, how do they work the, I guess, you know, how the, the back end this through the details of the financing, how does that work when someone gives a hundred dollar donation, let's say it goes to the donor C and then it, there's a hundred dollars for the project. I mean, you obviously have to pay for your platform. You have to pay for the people who, you know, and electricity and all that kind of stuff. How does that mm-hmm. sort of work with your organization when it comes to these kind of micro donations? Yes. Um, in terms of like how much goes to the project and yeah, that I mean, kind I of just thing. Kind or... of just wondering if, you know, if someone says they have a project that's $75, is that because they know that, well, it's really 70, but I know there's $5 that's got to be, you know, that's going to be <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. overhead somewhere. Yeah. So, okay. So that's a good question. So that really comes down to the, to the trust that you would have in the organization and in us, um, because there are obviously going to be expenses. So for, I'll give you this example. Like, let's say that you want to provide a goat for someone in, like even say the village that I used to visit every Friday. Let's say you want to, you want to donate a goat to someone in that village, which probably you can do on donor right now. Like we have a lot of, um, connections with, um, you know, organizations in Malawi. So let's say you want to do that. Well, it's not like you can just buy a goat and then like airdrop it into that village like there are <laughs> costs <laughs> yeah there are costs associated with getting that goat to the village you have to um one you have to drive to go purchase the goat second you have to drive to, to go take the goat into the village third you have to have like some kind of pre-existing infrastructure like you you don't want to just start dropping goats into random villages you want to understand you want to understand who are the people in this village who, who genuinely need the goat and then how do you and then w- with that um, how do you know that that goat is going to specifically help them? And how do you know that there's no fraud going on? How do you know that the chief of the village is not going to um, say like, yeah, this person needs to go, but then the chief of the village takes the goat for themselves. So these are all like common problems sure. in yeah. developing countries that people have to be aware of. And so what we do is we, like one of something that's very important to our vetting procedure is we really work very closely with people who are local living in the context um, and who understand like the opportunity to do good and have like a very good reputation in their society. Um, And that's just a very, very important part. So obviously there are like 
a lot of costs so like a lot of costs associated with like getting a goat to a family in need like there's the infrastructure and there's the transportation costs and so forth and this goes with like basically any type of project like sure, if you yeah. want to provide um a hearing aid to a young girl um built into the cost of the of, of that is there's a hearing exam that you have to do and you have to like remember you have to sort these people are coming from like very uh remote places and and often very difficult to get to and i would it's like i said i was just in malawi one of the things that's like craziest the, the one of the things that is is hard for for just any of us to imagine is a lot of the people that we partner with um they literally have like a, a bicycle taxi that is like their means of transportation so so someone is on a bicycle and then they get on the back of the bicycle and they pay the bicycle guy you know like two dollars to, 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 to bicycle them two hours one way and two hours the other way and that's how they're like transporting some of these things it's just crazy um the infrastructure that that the the infrastructure that's needed so um yeah, so it's really depend. It comes down to the trust that people have in our organization and in the organizations that we vet. But we really do work really hard to like we we reject ninety percent of the organizations that apply to work with us. Um, we really only work with organizations that have like high reputation. But at the end of the day, anytime you give to any charity, you have to have some level of trust there. Like that, that's unavoidable. So, right. um, well, that's yeah. and, and that's the advantage of donor seed, where you can actually see the projects and and you can say that really shouldn't be a thousand dollars for that goat, right? You'd say oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's something reasonable. And, and to your infrastructure question, I'm just a dumb American, right? But I watch um, like Top Gear and they're, but they do the car, mm -hmm. they do their tour across Africa. Yeah. It's amazing mm -hmm. to see the, you know, there are tons of people there. There are people who live there and these roads are, I mean, barely roads, right? They're like, mm -hmm. if, if yeah. somehow they drive cars and stuff. So I can definitely see how the infrastructure, it, it's always like driving through a mountain where you're like, oh, it's only 10 miles away and it takes you 40 minutes because, you know, it's all the switchbacks and stuff, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. And, I, and I feel, and just, you know, two, three orders of magnitude worse in, in places with worse roads. Um, you know, you touched a little bit on the dropping of goats everywhere, right? And so that reminds me of a talk I heard by Peter Greer where he was talking mm. about, um, I, I, I don't know if he wrote the book, When Helping Hurts, uh, but, you know, where they talk about, that was Brian they talk Finger about, you know, yeah. you, you provide a bunch of, you provide, let's say, uh, eggs for you get free eggs to a village for a couple of years and then you stop giving eggs and actually the, the village is worse off because yeah the, the whatever infrastructure they had for producing eggs and you know the chickens and all that stuff uh, couldn't develop because there's of course you can't you can't beat free and so yep. free is always going to win and so you you sort of hamper economic development in these places and so uh talk about that and sort of with this project i mean i, I imagine you're mindful of this sort of this sort of issue because you were in the yeah. villages right so Mm -hmm. What do you got? What do you, how are your, what are your thoughts about that? Well, Peter Greer is right. There's, there are a lot of second and third order effects that you have to, um, you have to mitigate against and be aware of. And um, sometimes like there are like the book when helping her it's on our like recommended reading list. Um, anyone who starts as an employee at donor we have them read that book. Um, so yes, very, it, we were very conscientious of these things. I'll give you a story, like a personal story of, of my life, because it kind of demonstrates how, how it led to how we do things. Um, you know, I talked about all these different uh, projects that we were doing that I was doing when I was visiting the villages on Friday. Right. Um, so I was visiting these villages on Friday. And um, I you know the projects were getting bigger and bigger and i was seeing okay a lot of people like want to be involved in 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 this and i'm i like want to encourage that so i want to do a big project so i convinced myself you know one of the things that's really tragic in a lot of these developing nations and especially in malawi is a very high uh, maternal and infant mortality rate so especially during delivery labor and delivery um there's a, a lot of mothers who sadly don't make it like astronomically higher than in developed countries and um so i thought okay i'm going to build a mater I'm going to fundraise and build a maternity ward and build a clinic and it's going to be this amazing thing that's just going to save all these lives um and so I started doing this so I started like talking to people I started talking to doctors and people and architects and people who could build this clinic in this in this village that I had picked out and I wasn't really getting a lot of buy-in from the local people who were who actually live in Malawi and I was like and people would tell me you know if you fundraise for a clinic you then have to staff the clinic like what's your plans for that and you know all, all these different que like questions that I hadn't thought about I didn't frankly have good answers to and so I kept trying to push forward on this project and I was just realizing you know the the buy-in from the local people was not there and so that's a red flag so um so I kind of like put the put a pin in that and I said okay so what what so i started asking people what should like if i were to do some kind of infrastructure project what is a good thing um to to build in this in this 
uh, in this country, in, in Malawi. And I talked to a, a bunch of people, everyone over and over and over again, everyone was saying girl, girls education. There's a major gender disparity gap in Malawi, like far more boys are educated, especially at the upper levels than girls. We need a girls high school in this country. And I just, everyone kept t- telling me that over and over and over again. So, okay, well, that was a signal. But then what is what is me, a guy in Northern Virginia, from Northern Virginia, going to go and, and just like build a, like, what do I know about building a school in rural <laughs> Africa? Um, so, um, it, it just so happened that there was this woman, Tia, who had, had been, she's very involved in her local, um, in, in, in the local area. Um, she had already had a ministry with young, young girls. Um, and then she had, for seven years, she actually had this vision document, this plan to build the school. She had all the curriculum, all the architecture, everything needed. She just needed $100,000 to kickstart the school. And you need a good person to like run these things. They don't, just, they don't run themselves. And I, obviously I'm not going to be the one to run them. Um, so Tia presented to me, it was very compelling. And I said, $100,000 is like way higher than what I was expecting to have to fundraise. But let me like, look, let me like try this. And so that's when I started doing the weekly fundraising with donors, with, uh, not, with Girls Shine Academy. And, you know, there were a few tight moments, but eventually the money came in. There were a, So we started fundraising in January. By September, 120 girls, you know, we're attending this brand new school that just popped up out of wow. nowhere. And then today we have over 300 girls attending that school, fully sustainable, doesn't require any, ex- any, any outside funding. Half the funds come from girls who pay a little bit more who come from the city and half the funds come from, and then well, all the funds come from that really. And then a small amount of funds come from like more vulnerable girls who come from the village and are able to get a much superior education than anything they had before. Many of these girls are the first literate, you know, people in their family, um, and so, yeah, so that's the type of thing you, I, I'm, we're very bought into the concept of, of working with and listening to the people who are on the ground, understand the economy. Cause even, even like, um, like if you talk to some of the people in Malawi about like the book, when helping hurts, like they've all heard it, you know, they all hear about the, the <laughs> yeah. Americans who read the book when helping hurts. And because of that, they're, you know, cautious about giving. And, but even they will say like, it's not that simple. Like there are like, cause like, for example, sometimes you'll have a baby, that um, needs formula milk and it's like a hundred or two hundred dollars to provide formula milk for that baby for for six months and on the one hand it's like well is that a sustainable solution because what do you do with the baby after after they have the formula milk on the other hand if the if the baby doesn't get the formula milk the baby dies so you can't just like simplify these things so that's what one of the reasons like we're very very um, pro working with local people who are very close and connected to the, to the causes. That's what, you know, that's why we do the video updates because you have to be close to the cause to get a video update. Um, and yeah, that's just a very important thing with, with the way that we do things. Sure. I mean, and, and to go that further, I mean, you have to probably then go down to the root of why the baby doesn't, why they don't, family doesn't have enough money. Totally. Them, right. I mean, that's, and those are the things you're trying to solve with, you know, yes. like you mentioned education, right. Or whatever. Yeah. So one of the things I always try and separate um, when I do these podcasts, like I only get the word out about this, is I separate the ideas of relief and development. Development yes. is the idea of like addressing the underlying cause that takes care of the baby. And then relief is the idea that there are just vulnerable people who have very urgent needs right now that it's, I just think it's the compassionate thing to do to take care of them. You don't want to do that with like an able-bodied man who should be working and like you're incentivizing him to like just beg on the streets. You don't want to do that. But there are like orphans, there's widows, there are, men, there are people who suffer from mental illness, there are people, families who get in really difficult situations. And there are situations, or there are even like natural disasters that happen. There are situations where relief is appropriate. Um, and I think just, I think the more that people understand the difference between relief and development, and, and they're, they're both good things to do, um, I think it'll just clear up some of the, you know, the misconceptions that are out there about, you know, when is it right to help? Right. When does relief become chronic, I suppose, is sort of the, the, the question, yeah. right? So, yeah. Um, and, yeah. and so that kind of delves into the, the things I want to talk to you specifically about today, because when it comes to medical missions and medical relief, there are lots of physicians I know who do medical work. Um, and I mean, some of the things are very obvious, like I've seen uh, calls where you have some kid breaks his leg and has a compound fracture, has to go to the hospital and they need like $40. Like yes, yesterday <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. take care of, right. Get the antibiotics yeah. and to get the leg set. Uh, and so that would be obviously your relief thing, but we have lots of people who go every year to the same village, let's say like in Honduras, I've, it's a lot of people I work with here go to central America and mm-hmm. part of me is always like concerned, like, you know, if you're always going there, is it, is it a matter of that they'll never bother developing, you know, the 
the the infrastructure they need in order to their yeah. own med- self-sustaining medical clinics. Um, you know, are you going, it would it be better to go there and like train people? I, I'm always just, I struggle with kind of knowing the right answer. And maybe that's because I'm just not on the ground, right? I'm just some- No, yeah, I have a lot of uh, thoughts about this. I'm happy to share. So, because I I try not to be too, you know, there was a time in my life where I felt like I was, you know, I came back from Malawi, poorest country on the planet. I was living in Northern Virginia, one of the wealthiest zip codes in the country. I I became kind of cynical for a little little while, just (laughs) from having that kind of like abrupt change of lifestyle um, and being around like very different people. Anyways, there was a time in my life I was kind of cynical. I try not to do that anymore. I'm like, I'm I'm a pretty open-minded, understanding person. I I get where people are coming from. Also, I had the opportunity to live for three years in Malawi. That's an opportunity not a lot of people get to have. So I just have this added perspective and I, you know, that's a blessing. Um, When it comes to, you know, what are sometimes called short term mission trips, um, I'm, I'm really in favor of the idea, I'm really in favor of the idea of people visiting as much as possible, like I want people to visit a lot, because I think it connects, like even me going to Malawi, um, it it connects you to the, it it makes it a lot more real, um, by by visiting and people like, and and that's a really important uh, thing to happen for someone who's who lives in our world, like tech, technological paradise, effectively in, by comparison, like we, we live in America. It's like this amazingly well-run. I know that we have our problems, but it's amazingly well-run country. And then you li- you go somewhere else and you realize that that's kind of like the majority of how the planet lives. Like the majority of humans on the planet are living lives a very different lifestyle than how we live here in America. And those are good kind of like things to happen. You can't really have that. It's harder to have that happen unless you go visit. Um, on the one, so that's on the one hand, I, I, I really like when people visit, I do think it's, it would be better. It would be more optimal if people, when they visited, they went with kind of under a better pretense. Um, so I wish, you know, sometimes they go there kind of, everyone's wearing the same shirt and they go there kind of with this, this impression that like, we're doing all this good. We're saving the world. Um, look at how amazing we are. I don't really think that that's appropriate. Um, I think they should, I think that the, the trips, you know, if you do a short-term mission trip, it's mission is almost like not a good way to think about it because it should almost be like a personal journey trip or something like that. Like you have, there should be an understanding that you're doing this, like it's, you're going to get, you're going to benefit far more from this than, than you'll any kind of value that you provide. Um, And, you know, a lot of people in the country who the receiving country, they like the, when people come and visit and so forth, like, it's not like they they want them to like go away. Um, But I think it would help if there was an attitude there that like, I'm going, I'm going to personally benefit from this quite a bit. I'm not going to really provide that much value. Like, let's just be honest. Um, And like, let's just put it out there. Like if I'm spending two and a half thousand dollars flying myself out there, taking accommodations, all this other stuff, obviously that money would be much better spent if I just donated it to um, like several, you know, various different effective causes that are over there. Like, let's just, uh, let's just call a spade a spade. Like that's actually true. Like you just, if you spent the money, if you donate the money, it would be more effective than going on on the trip, but the trip is still highly valuable and you should go. um, But then you should come back and you should donate more because you, because of how transformed you were by the trip, you know? So that's kind of, those are, that's my take on it. Yeah. I, I talk to the docs who do this, you know, they, they go away every year and they have specialized skills, right. They don't exist in those like treating yeah. cliff, lip, or cliff palette. Right. I mean, there's no one in that country who can really do that. And, and to your point, the relief, if they don't do it. It'll never get done. Right. I mean, you could, those kids say, well, we build the infrastructure, but mean, that's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's like 25 years. So you, to you, you're trained. So it's cool. Get up yeah. in there good, where they can surgically treat that. And then, you know, large country, you're not going to have many people. Who yeah, do so I, do I do want to also draw a distinction just in fairness to some of your friends, because I, I actually do think, you know, some of those like orthopedic surgeons and stuff, we had a we had a surgeon fly in um, when I was in Malawi, there was this the girl who, who was who was deaf and she couldn't like hearing aids were not going to fix it. It was like we tried bone conduction hearing aids and that wasn't going to be enough. Um, so a surgeon flew in from the UK. It was like a fifty thousand dollar cochlear implant surgery that was just donated this girl can hear now. And she's the first cochlear implant surgery in the entire country of Malawi. And, you know, how long, like that girl, I don't know how long it would take to build the infrastructure to provide cochlear implant surgery from the local people. And so, you know, there's, there's stuff, I don't want to be like too judgmental there. Anyways, I guess my point is in fairness to some of your friends, there's a lot of medical stuff. I'm like very pro, just like, please go do that work. People will benefit. And then there's other stuff that's like, we're going to go build houses you're, you know, you're doing kind of like you're taking away low skill labor from people. That that's more what I was I was referring right. to yeah. earlier. And, yeah. and I agree too. But I always, I you know, I 
I always wonder, like, what's the most effective thing to do as mission? I mean, and the thing is, like, one individual usually can't make that decision. You can't say, well, if I don't go to, you know, Haiti to help someone out, then I'm obviously not going to, um, you know, I, I can't, it's not a, it's not a binary decision, right? Whether I'm going to Haiti or yeah. whether I'm actually providing money for someone else to do the work or whatever it is. And so, I, you know, like if I want to try and help advance and so that they have the infrastructure and they have the medical knowledge to do something, does me going there, does that prevent them from developing that? And the answer is probably no, because it's probably fairly sophisticated in a, in a developed country, right? I mean, it, so I don't know, maybe those are concerns I should, maybe that's just yeah. overthinking things, right? <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Like, that's I, that's the thing that I think. If you were to talk to someone like one of my, you know, friends who grew up in Malawi, lives there their whole life, started in the village, went to, you know, went to school. If you talk to one of those people, they would say that there is like, there's there's like there is plenty of reason to be like cautious about the way that you do charity. But then there's also plenty of reasons to to, to like make sure that you're still act like don't do nothing. You know, don't be par- paralyzed right. by. Um, so if you talk to them and I, so that was something I personally learned from, from some of the people I lived with in Malawi. Cause like on the one hand, I, like I'm reading the same materials, you know, I'm reading stuff from my d- friends, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these books, they're, they're, they're written in like air conditioned libraries in America. You know, it's like, it is a little bit uh, removed from like the actual situation. So you do have to have this kind of just, that's why I'm just like really pro building these relationships with the people who are on the ground to have like that, that the ability to, 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 to differentiate the nuance of, of these various different situations because it, it's complex. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that probably there's no better solution than to be on the ground and to have local knowledge and to yeah. be dealing with people who know what, I mean, you know, it's like uh, just randomly buying Christmas present for someone rather than getting a Christmas list, right. And knowing what they actually need or want, right. Just trying, mm-hmm. just yeah. guessing and make them something that's just going to end up collecting dust or something. Uh, um, when you go, to the to Malawi and you mentioned about the schools and so clearly one of the one solution is being able to to train people or give people the the, the knowledge and skill sets that they can to develop their economy and to move forward in today's world I mean obviously I, it's actually shocking seeing my foster son who has I don't know how much his family actually makes in Guatemala but it's not much I don't mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure like where he left they had a light bulb like in their house mm-hmm. that was like yeah. you know, just one. And yet they all have oh. cell phones now. It's remarkable, oh, yeah. like they, yeah. right? It's incredible. And so clearly, I mean, technology is like ubiquitous in these, and so because it's so inexpensive, but they have to be able to know how to use it and to actually, I, I guess, to have those technical skills to to utilize that and to transform their local economy. And that's that's kind of it. I heard you talking about a new project with a school. It seems like that's kind of like what you're looking at a little bit, right? Yeah, so we're partnering with ABC, and and ABC has a network of colleges um, around Africa, and a network of schools, I should say, because they have more than just colleges. Um, And so we recently launched the first, uh, a project to build the first ever STEM school in Malawi. So it'll be a STEM school for boys and girls, high school age, starting starting in middle school. Um, And yeah, we're trying to raise $450,000. I think we have 130, 140,000 that's mm-hmm. already been donated. Um, so we've made like some good progress on there, but yeah, we'd love, we'd love to raise that as soon as possible. And if anyone's thinking about making an end of year gift, I, I would really recommend that you think about making your gift towards this STEM school. So you can go to donorc.com slash STEM. So D-O-N-O-R-S-E-E.com slash S-T-E-M. Um, and it's a really great, it's a really great initiative. And I think one of the you know, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about on this podcast uh, in terms of relief or development, this is one of the best development projects that I've ever been a part of, I've ever seen. You know, I lived in Malawi for three years. This is one of those things that it's going to be a before and after moment for the country, for the entire country of Malawi. Um, we're working with people who are like very well connected on the ground. Um, the school system, ABC, that we're partnering with, they have connections like both with the government and with um, the Ministry of Education and with the local people there. Um, and so they're going to have people lined up at the gate ready to go to this to this school. And um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is anyone who donates. Um, they'll get their name on the plaque as one of the founding donors. So my name will be on the plaque and anyone who donates, they'll get to see their name um, on the plaque of this building and you'll get to watch the construction because it's all through donor C. Um, so you get to see videos and stuff as it, as it goes up, but it's a really, really worthwhile project. It's a really good thing for, for, you know, a, a community here in America to come around. Okay. I, I, one more thing. I actually have one more thing I want to say, because people, some people are like um, people, you know, there's plenty of stuff, plenty of issues going on here in America. There's plenty of, you know, 
uh, yeah. you know, people are have all sorts of stuff that's going on. Um, that's very understandable. And so I, I've actually had a few questions recently, like, well, this is in Malawi. Like, why are we building up Malawi instead of like America? You know, what, that's a fair question that people ask. I understand where it's coming from. And, and so I've been thinking about that. And I think my answer is, you know, it's very fortunate that we all got to be born in America. And because of that, we had access to this amazing infrastructure growing up. We had access, we have access to opportunity at like an unprecedented level um, in, in most of human history. And it could have very well happened that we were one of those people born in Malawi, a place with no STEM school and in um, a place where there's where, you know, uh, in America, there's one in three, for every 300 people, there's one doctor in Malawi. For every 30,000 people, there's one doctor. So just very, very different infrastructure there. You could have been one of those people who was born there. And if you had been one of those people, like, wouldn't you want someone on the other side of the world to care about you in this moment? Like during this holiday season, wouldn't you kind of hope that someone on the other side of the world really thought, you know, I'm going to, you know, I know that they're on the other side of the world. Um, and I know that I might never meet them, but, you know, I, I, they deserve some help this holiday season. And so, um, yeah, I, I really pr uh, ask people to consider making a donation to the to the STEM school. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, ultimately, the impact you have on other people, you you don't recognize the impact you have on most people, right? Because you yeah. make someone's day better, and then they go and do something nice for someone. I mean, the, the, you know, the butterfly effect or whatever, you can't possibly know that. Give, give me an idea, because, uh, you know, I've been to, I've not been to any country that's as poor as Malawi, or even close to that. I mean, Mexico does not count. <laughs> so, uh what, how transformational would a school like this be? Like, you know, someone could say, well, it's one school. What is it, like a couple hundred kids? I mean, what difference is that going to make for in a country of, I don't know, how many million people? Yeah. What, sort of, what sort of things do you envision like this? Does this like spur other schools from being formed? Do people like, mm -hmm. you know, give me an idea of what your vision is yeah. for the, what the, where this is going to go. Well, so as, as an example, you know, I recently brought some people out to Malawi just two months ago. Some of them were visiting for the first time. They'd never really been in a, in a country as poor as Malawi before. And Malawi has, you know, some nice, they have, you know, a government hospital, they have some grocery stores and, and um, they have some nice roads and stuff like that. Um, but that's not how the majority of the country lives. The majority of the country lives in, in these kind of rural villages. So I took some people out to these rural villages um, and the way that they described it, because it was the first time that they were there, they just said it was it was shocking. They said that they felt like they were in, they were they felt like they were going back to the year like 700. Because even in you know in Europe during certain periods of time in, in the 1500s, there's like these beautiful basilicas being built and so forth. But you go to one of these rural villages, um, and a, there's a lot of people who live in 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 situations that's just very hard to grasp. You just can't believe it. Um, so imagine taking a situation where you're like in the year seven, you know, the, the level of development is in the year 700, and you're putting a 2021 school um, for uh, that, that would give access to people coming from that background. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I think that it's just hard to comprehend just how transformational it'll be. The, the other thing I, I think is worth mentioning is this is the first STEM school in the entire country of Malawi. It's one of the first STEM schools on the entire continent of Africa. And um, for a STEM school to be built in a, in a, developing, in a, in a developing nation, um, and, and for it's, it's going to be done, you know, it's not, it's, it's going to be done, the Ministry of Education is approving it, but it's, it's done entirely privately funded by donors. Right, right. Um, and so it's an amazing model that I think will, uh, people all over the, the continent of Africa and all over any kind of developing nation around the world, they'll be able to look at that and they'll be able to say, okay, that country privately funded their own STEM school and look at the transformation it have, and it'll serve as a model that will go out to people all over the all over the world, and we think we're going to see STEM schools just pop up all over the place because of the, because of um, because of what we as a donor community do for this STEM school um, here this holiday season. I mean, do you with the STEM school? Do you see like uh, changes in in what jobs opportunities and stuff like if people create? I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to understand if you know if you dropped if you gave an iPhone to someone who's in seven seven hundred AD, it'd be a paperweight at best, right? I mean, that's assuming mm -hmm. they had paper. But so how does so how does a school, how does it affect things like in Malawi? Yeah, so it's it's not an all-encompassing solution that will solve all of no, the country's sure. problems for the end of time. But what it does is it creates a um, it creates a uh, a leveling up for the entire country. So it sets a new standard for what it means to have a 
a great school in, in the country of Malawi. Um, so as people start entering this school, they'll be able to, um, they'll, they'll be fed into uh, nearby like med medical colleges. Um, so you're increasing the number of doctors in Malawi, you're increasing the number of engineers in Malawi, you're increasing the number of um, architects. And so because of that, you know, one of the big problems that Malawi has um, is that people, people want to leave the country because there's no opportunity for their children in the country. Sure. And so by providing a, a STEM school, you're keeping the doctors and the engineers and the architects and the scientists and the mathematicians and all the, all the really intelligent data scientists out there um, who really help a country have amazing infrastructure like that we have here in the States. Um, you, you allow, you, 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 those people get to st want to stay in the country because there's actually an option for their school. And ABC, I, I have to say, ABC is one of the, is, uh, has been doing this for a long time. They've been uh, building uh, schools across Africa for 40 years and have a lot of success in this. So a lot of their graduates, they go on to, they don't leave the countries that they're in. They go, like one of the people I know, Blessings, he was a graduate of ABC. Um, he went to go get his master's in Arizona, but then, but then, you know, he lived in Arizona. It's a very nice place to live. He lived in Arizona, got his master's degree, then came back to Malawi. And now he's in Malawi full time. He has a donor seat profile. He's he's a um, I'm working with him right now to build a trade school in a local village. And um, and it's because of these these uh, institutions that are really well run, like ABC and, and like the STEM school, that people stick around and invest in the local economy as opposed to leaving and going elsewhere. Right. It's a classic brain drain, right? Like if you, yeah. you, you have a, you don't want all your professionals leaving your country. STEM right? school is an antidote to brain are. drain, essentially. But, sure. I mean, that's, that's what, it, that's one way you can think about it. Yeah. And I, I imagine too, that it, it may even be attractive for other people in Africa or other places, parts of the world, right? It's a, there's now. So that know, would be amazing if you could start recruiting people to come to like, even in nearby places, um, even you, people would draw comparisons, you know, if, if you're, if, if you're someone who is from the continent of Africa, they, they, very, they very much distinguish like which country you're from. Sure. So someone who's like from Kenya, um, like they have a little bit more of a developed country, like Nairobi is a really incredible city by um, in comparison to like, you know, the cities in Malawi. Um, so yeah, this is, this is, Malawi is like one of the least developed places on the entire planet. And you're, you're, you're putting this great infrastructure there. And I think the other thing that's important to mention is um, there's a guy named Yanni LaRue who's already agreed to run the school as soon as it's up and running. Um, and he has a, a really strong STEM background, has already, was already the head, are, he's the, currently the headmaster of a school in South Africa. He's been the headmaster of a school in Malawi before, really understands it. And he's gonna be the one pioneering this project and making it amazing. So he's the one, in the same way that we had that woman Tia who made Girls Shine Academy successful, Yanni is gonna be the one that makes the STEM school successful. So we have a really good person who's going to be running it. Yeah, well, that's great. And again, I, you know, if you haven't checked out Donor C, it sounds just the way it's spelled just the way it sounds. And so <laughs> I, I recommend you, you can get an app on your phone. You can go to the website, uh, and it's a great way of either picking individual projects, or you can have a monthly contribution, or you can do both. Whatever you want to do, right? And so uh, yeah. you get video updates. I get things that I didn't realize I was contributing to because <laughs> I just have a donation <laughs> yeah. goes monthly. I'm like, oh, see what this is. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's actually a really great way of connecting people. And, you know, they're small projects, so it's pretty easy if you don't even have a lot to give that you can, you can transform one person's life. No, you know, not everybody's like building a school, but you can certainly do some uh, change one person's life significantly just with providing them a bed or, you know, I don't know, like whether they can go to barber, sh barber school or something like that. It's really, we have a lot uh, of projects. Yeah. Where you can provide yeah. training and trade schools and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Both the development and relief are, are, available on our platform. And it, yeah, Eric, thank you very much for, um, yeah, for allowing me to highlight Donorcy and for being a supporter and wearing the shirt. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're um, No, it's great. I, I really love the organization. I love, um, because I, I guess it's very personal and I think it's, uh, yeah. you really feel where, you know, where your money's going and, uh, I don't know you feel like you make a difference, which is kind of nice. You do make yeah, a difference. I can tell you for a fact. I see it. You know, I, I was just in Malawi, and the like. I, I tell people whenever you donate on Donorcy, you know that somewhere on the other side of the world, someone is like dancing for joy or just sobbing sobs of relief. You know, you know that that's happening every time you make any kind of donation. So it is a difference that you're making, and um, that's why I that's why I do what I do. Um, that's why I started it so that I, you know, I, I was able to make those differences when I lived in Malawi. Now I want people all over the world to be able to make those differences. Yeah. Well, it's great. I'm so, I'm so happy for you that you found a way to fulfill your life because that's sometimes being feeling unfulfilled is really challenging. Not that it, you know, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, that's yeah, that's exactly right. What's a, aside from going to the website, 
social media, where do people find stuff on Donor C, uh, Twitter, Facebook? Yeah, so all that kind um, of stuff? I- at the time we're recording this, I'll, I'll encourage everyone to check out the, the new, uh, we have a, a mini documentary coming out tomorrow, um, might be out by the time that that this is um, that this airs. And um, so, so that's on our YouTube channel, which you can just type in DonorC on YouTube. Um, and then Facebook and Instagram and uh, DonorC.com. And then the STEM school is DonorC.com slash STEM, if you want to donate directly to that. Um, and like, like I said, you'll get your name on the plaque, or if you donate at a higher level, you'll get, um, there's, you, there's the opportunity to have like a classroom named after you and, and things like that. So. All right. Well, that's very cool. Hey, Greg Gle- Glyer from DonorC. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher and share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. <laughs>